Let me ask you a question. What do you think is the biggest lie ever told? Well, it could be two simple words. Those words are net zero. To save our planet, we're told we must get to carbon net zero. We must fly less, walk more, or go vegan for the cause, or even have less children for the sake of hitting this goal. The alternative for not doing so, the destruction of our world. Entire nations have signed up to this net zero promise. Justin Trudeau has promised to get Canada there by 2050, and nations like New Zealand have pledged to hit this target even earlier. But what if net zero has been hijacked? What if it's a tool used by the oil industry to make billions of dollars in profit while continuing to destroy our planet? Well, unfortunately, that appears to be the case. And the worst part, they're using your money to do it. Money that's being willingly given to them by your government. Ready to get taken on a ride? Well, the story of how net zero is being used by some of the dirtiest companies in the world to make an obscene amount of money is definitely a wild ride. But unfortunately, it's not a very fun one. So to start off with, let's find out where the term net zero actually came from and who is responsible for creating all these net zero rules, laws and targets that seem to be affecting our lives more and more every single day. The term net zero was first popularized in 2016 at the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement at COP21, an event mediated and hosted by the United Nations. Today, almost all our planet's targets for net zero come directly from the UN itself. So you would imagine it's people care the most about our environment and understand what net zero even means. This is Mark Carney. He's the UN's special envoy for climate change. In other words, basically the top guy responsible for helping our world transition to a net zero future. But he's also a banker and vice chairman of investment firm Brookfield, who last year boasted that the firm is net zero across its entire half trillion dollar asset portfolio. Unfortunately, this wasn't even close to being true. In an expose by Unearthed, it was quickly discovered Brookfield is the leading shareholder in billions in fossil fuel infrastructure products, including gas pipelines in Canada, the Middle East and the United States, as well as being the largest shareholder in a coal shipping port in Australia. Once caught out in his lie, Carney quickly backpedaled, admitting that Brookfield's business is actually far from being net zero. So we're not off to a very good start here. If one of the people most responsible for our net zero future can't seem to get it right, who can we trust? Well, definitely not the oil companies who have been using net zero promises in order to greenwash their image whilst making billions of dollars of the continued destruction of our planet. And one of the biggest offenders in this practice is a company we've previously mentioned on this channel. At a media event in 2020, the CEO of BP made a spectacular announcement. By 2050, he promises BP would achieve achieve net zero emissions. This made environmentalists very happy. However, this was basically a blatant lie. In the fine print of BP's pledge, the definition of net zero only covered the emissions created as a direct result of processing and drilling oil. But there are many things it wouldn't cover, like the pollution produced by BP's massive supply chain or the emissions created when its products are burnt. For example, the exhaust put out by ships, cars or planes that use its oil. Its pledge also conveniently excluded 40% of its global oil production and left out the emissions produced by Russian's energy giant Rosneft that BP owned a 20% stake in at the time, meaning the only place BP's net zero campaign was really green was in the flashy new graphics they designed to promote it. Basically, BP promising that it's going to reach net zero by 2050 is like me handing you a fish sandwich and promising you that it's actually a $20 bill. But empty words aside, here is where oil companies have pulled off maybe their greatest scam ever. Quite simply, by promising to pull carbon out of thin air in order for us to reach net zero. Carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as CCS, is a technology that pulls CO2 from our atmosphere. It sounds mighty futuristic, but it's an idea that's been around for a very long time. CCS was first implemented in the 1970s, but it's over the last few decades where it's been called a solution to the climate crisis. In the year 2000, the United Nations Body for Climate Change, the IPCC, projected we'd be using CCS to collect huge amounts of carbon by 2020, forecasting it would pull nearly 5,000 million tons of CO2 from our atmosphere annually. Keep this figure in mind because I'm going to come back to this in a moment. So with the climate doomsday clock ticking, governments began handing over billions to companies who promised to use the technology to help us solve the carbon problem. And many of these grants to invest in CCS went to the world's largest oil companies, in other words, to some of the most polluting entities on Earth. So did all this money being pumped into carbon capture actually work? Short answer, nope. 
In Canada, Shell's Quest carbon capture facility was built with almost a billion dollars in government grants. Shell says Quest is a thriving example of CCS at work. However, the plant has been found to actually emit more greenhouse gases than it collects, meaning it would likely be better for the environment if it didn't exist at all. But despite these sad figures, Shell has just announced a second carbon capture facility in Canada. And like Shell's previous project, Trudeau's government will likely give Canadian taxpayer money to build it. It's a similar story in Australia, where oil giant Chevron was given $60 million in taxpayer funding to create the world's largest carbon capture project. But for years, the Gorgon CCS plant basically did nothing. It captured no carbon at all for the first year it operated, and even had to shut down in 2019 after becoming clogged with sand. Eventually, the Gorgon plant did start working. But while Chevron has only captured 2% of the emissions it initially promised to, it has happily captured 100% of the $60 million given to it by Australian taxpayers. But these are only two examples of CCS failing to work. To get the full picture, we need to go back to the United Nations Year 2000 projections of how much carbon this technology would capture. As previously mentioned, investments in carbon capture were projected to pull 5,000 million tonnes from our atmosphere per year. But when 2020 hit, the number was barely 10 million tonnes globally, just 0.2% of the target. In fact, since since the inception, not a single one of the UN IPCC carbon capture targets has been successfully hit. So basically, we're handing billions of tax dollars to oil companies in order to fund technology that doesn't really do much, all because our planet is really obsessed with net zero targets. But if carbon capture technology doesn't really work yet, why are oil companies so obsessed with getting as much funding for it as possible? I'll talk about that in a second, but I just quickly wanted to mention that we have an amazing newsletter of 75,000 people plus that are loving extra financial gems packaged in beautifully written stories. There's a link down below. Okay, back to the story. Now, here's why oil companies likely want so much funding for the carbon capture technology. It's because they figured out sneaky ways in order to use that carbon to make them billions of dollars of extra oil revenue. In 2006, the oil industry's lobbying group, the API, released a brochure which spoke heavily about the benefits of CCS. But they also let slip what are probably the industry's real intentions for the technology. After capturing carbon, oil companies are able to pump it back into the ground. The CO2 then bonds with oil deposits deposits that were previously too difficult or expensive to reach, allowing them to flush more oil back to the surface. In simple terms, capturing carbon allows them to get more oil and make more money. This type of oil harvesting is called enhanced oil recovery. Oil companies would like you to believe that a barrel of oil harvested via EOR is actually good for the environment, creating 37% less emissions than what conventional oil does. But what they won't tell you is that because more oil is being produced overall, more total emissions are being created. So while they're capturing some carbon to generate EOR oil, once that oil is burnt, it goes on to produce even more CO2 than was captured in the first place, meaning that the only positive side effect of EOR is more profits for oil companies and their shareholders. Basically, they're capturing carbon just so that they can use it to pull even more oil out of the ground, and once burnt, it will create more CO2 in the atmosphere than actually reduce it. And this is basically the entire problem with the net zero concept, is that companies are using that phrase to sound good whilst diverting our attention away from their profit-mongering activities. And it's here where they become masters of using creative net zero wording. There are hundreds of examples of energy companies greenwashing their way to a net zero image. For example, oil companies are talking a lot lately about how they're lowering their emissions intensity. This sounds great, but isn't what most people think it is. Emissions intensity refers to the CO2 created based on a unit of economic activity. For example, how much carbon a company emits per $1 million it makes. So if intensity drops, but revenue grows, it's actually not doing much at all. A perfect example of this is French oil company Total. They invested in loads of PR, boasting how their emissions intensity had dropped by 6%. But as they were actually 
increasing oil production activity, their overall emissions had increased by 8%, something Total kept very quiet about. Another example is ExxonMobil, the fourth largest oil company on the planet. For years, they've been promising to lower emissions to contribute to a net zero future, even sponsoring the world's largest earth science conference for 15 years to help improve its image. But despite this, Exxon's promises have been basically empty, as it generated no green energy at all for the 11 years between 2009 and 2020. And even though I've just illustrated how EOR is likely overall worse for the environment than just investing in green energy, it doesn't stop oil companies boasting about how it's an important step in a net zero carbon economy. And remember the Gorgon CCS plant in Australia I mentioned earlier? Its many technical problems resulted in it emitting almost 8 million tons of CO2 over a two-year period, meaning this one facility completely wiped out the CO2 savings of every single rooftop solar panel in Australia over the same time period. I could go on, but there are just too many examples of this net zero absurdity to mention in one video. But to me, I hope that this is illustrating the glaring problems with this whole net zero concept. The big problem with net zero is there is no agreed upon standard for what actually defines it, which is why companies can use that phrase to make whatever pledges they want for the future. They can make bold promises or peddle massive lies while acting in ways that leave our planet worse off than it was before. And as usual, this is all done in the name of profit. Basically, they don't really have to make any positive change now. And instead, they can just use net zero promises to leave addressing the problem to a future generation, or as the YouTube channel Out Changing Climate perfectly put it. Cases, however, net zero climate targets are just a buzz phrase for procrastinating until the very last second. And possibly the worst part of this whole scenario, it's all being bought and paid for with our tax dollars. Long story short, whenever there's trillions of dollars involved in something that impacts our entire planet, you should really follow the money because money will generally tell a more truthful story than the oil companies will. In saying that, I strongly believe that we need a solution for the climate crisis, but is net zero and carbon capture technology the solution? I'm not so sure, but what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you'll also really enjoy the video we recently did on how BP literally created the term carbon footprint, link down below. Thanks so much for watching and do check out that newsletter. People actually rave about it. Also like and subscribe. And we do have a private membership with all things finance and freedom. Link down below for more information. And I will see you in the next one.